Our text this morning is taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, reading the first four verses. The first three verses, I think we'll hold it there. <clears throat> Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything <clears throat> that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let us pray. Father, we uh, ask you now to take these words that were penned through the guidance of your Holy Spirit and help us to apply them to our situation wherever we are at. And may we give you the honor and the glory for being such a loving God that you are. And so we commit this service to you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll notice that the uh, title of the sermon is Grit. <clears throat> Grit has a lot of meanings, <clears throat> but we're making the application to this passage this morning. When I uh, left my church in Bolton, as you know from my telling you before, they used to have a tennis tournament every year, and uh, they called me up and invited me back to be in the tennis tournament because um, I had just left, and at uh, any rate, uh, I got in that tennis tournament and came down to the semifinals, and the lady that called me, she had her own tennis court, and uh, she says, it's really very important that you win this next, next match. She says, this guy that you're playing is very obnoxious. <laughs> and she says, we would like to see him uh, be humbled. <laughs> well, uh, now that put a lot of pressure on me because I really appreciated her in all the years that she let me use her court. Uh, at any rate, uh, that was probably the hardest match that I've ever played in my life. He brought his seven-year-old daughter who kept on running around the court, especially on his side, so I'd be distracted. And, and uh, and it was a grueling match, absolutely grueling. But I kept on remembering what, uh, her name was Bonnie, what she had said. And, uh, and finally, uh, the, the game was over and I had barely won. And I went back to my car and my whole body went into a spasm. <laughs> I've never had that happen before. It was that, that grueling. Uh, any rate, uh, Bonnie said to me afterwards, she says, you have a lot of grit. <laughs> and at the time, I thought that was uh, an insult. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, now, uh, after preparing this sermon, I think I know what she, what she means. Sometimes, when we become Christians, when we come to know Jesus personally, when we were born again, if you will, saved. Sometimes people get the idea that that's the end result of their spiritual journey. That, as you well know, couldn't be further from the truth. The reality is, is that coming to know Jesus as our Savior is only the beginning of a lifelong race of faith. And that race of faith, as was brought out in our men's breakfast yesterday morning, is different for everyone. Uh, some races have more obstacles to overcome. When I uh, went to high school and uh, was playing football or practicing uh, that first year, the coach would make me run extra laps he would find anything to have me do more push-ups. 
And I really felt like he was being terribly unfair. And finally, I got up the courage one day to confront him. <laughs> and I said to him, as a coach, I said, you know, I don't know what I've done to cause you to take it out on me, but I said, I really believe you're being unfair. And uh, he looked at me and he said, Dave, when I stop paying attention to you, that's when you need to start to worry. And, and I've always remembered that. And uh, sometimes in life, uh, we get discouraged. We think, God, why are you picking on me? <laughs> and then as we read further in the book of uh, Hebrews, uh, it talks about how God disciplines those that he loves. And the purpose of that discipline is to make us more holy uh, and to be more like Christ. There are many spiritual miles that uh, we must travel before this race of faith is over. In my freshman year in high school, we had what was called a decathathon. Uh, this was a 10 event track and field contest. And uh, in my freshman class, there were two of us who were favored to win that event. And that was a fellow by the name of Dick Nelson, he was 6'4", and myself. He was a star basketball player, he was a star football player. And there were three races in this decathlon, a 100-yard dash, a 220-yard dash, and a quarter of a mile race. And there were three jumping events, the high jump, the long jump, the pole vault. And then last but not least, the 10th event, and the final event was a 220-yard high hurdles race. And coming into the, this last event, believe it or not, Dick and I were absolutely tied with regards to points. So whoever won that hurdle race would win the decathlon, which was highly sought after by uh, the fellows in the freshman class. Well, when I went over that first hurdle, I got my foot caught in it. And I... Uh, it got tangled up and I went falling to the ground. And I remember how discouraged I was and I almost walked off the track. But with what you might call sheer grit, I got up and I started running again. And lo and behold, Dick got tangled up in the last hurdle. <laughs> and uh, uh, grit, our dictionaries tell us, is an unyielding determination, unyielding determination. In our text this morning, we have one word that sums up this whole idea of grit, and that is the word perseverance. Our author writes, he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance that is, let us run with grit, the race that is marked out for us. And as I said, that race is different for each one of us. Perseverance, our dictionaries tell us, is an activity maintained in spite of difficulties. As one professor puts it, the person who scored well on an SAT will not necessarily be the best doctor or the best lawyer or the best businessman. These tests do not measure perseverance. These tests do not measure grit. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, Spurgeon, that famous preacher, he once said that it was by perseverance that the snail reached the ark. <laughs> A well-known theologian puts it like this. He says, perseverance is that quality in your life that makes it possible for you to live in such a way that nothing keeps you down. And I like the way that Micah, the Old Testament prophet, puts it with regards to Israel enemies, Israel's enemies that were laughing at her uh, when uh, Israel was down at one point. And speaking on behalf of Israel, he says, don't laugh at me. Although I have fallen, I will rise again. Perseverance is what this book of Hebrews is all about. It's about hanging in there. It's about not giving up. 
It's about spiritual staying power. It's about having unyielding courage in the face of hardship and difficulties. In this book, the author is writing to some Jewish Christians who are dangerously close to giving up on their newfound faith in Christ. He's writing to some Jewish Christians who are dangerously close to throwing in the towel because of the trials that they are facing. And so in the 10th chapter, he says to them, remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of sufferings? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Now immediately after telling these Jewish Christians that they need to persevere, that is they need to have grit, this Arthur then goes on in the next chapter, that famous chapter of Hebrews 11, and he gives them this impressive list of believers who couldn't be kept down. Uh, believers who in spite of their hardships maintain their confidence in God. Believers who in spite of getting their foot caught in that hurdle, if you will, they get up and they kept running. Believers who kept running towards the goal, as the Apostle Paul would later put it. Believers who got up and kept running in order to win the prize for which God had called them heavenward. And so after giving us this impressive list of Old Testament saints who persevered, the spokesman of God then turns his eyes towards these Jewish Christians and towards you and towards me. And he says to us in the first verse of chapter 12, therefore, in light of these witnesses that uh, we just mentioned, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Now in trying to get a handle on this very important verse of scripture, we need to look at th three words that this author uses. The first word is the word witnesses. A witness is someone who gives testimony to something that they have experienced firsthand. And so when this author of Hebrews tells us that since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what he is talking about is believers like you and like me. Believers who, through grit, through perseverance, finished the race of faith and who are now able to give testimony to the fact that there is a way to live the Christian life triumphantly. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we should therefore run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. You see, what this great cloud of witnesses is saying to us, loud and clear, is this. We ran through the fire. We ran through the lion's den. We ran through the beasts in the arena. We ran through the swords and the persecution. We ran through crisis after crisis in faith, trusting God. And do you know what? We won. With him, we became more than conquerors. And so when you fall up, fall down, get up. This is what the author of Hebrews is saying to us. Continue the race. Don't throw the towel in. For when the race is over, with the strength, strength that God will provide for you, you too will be winners in this race of faith. The uh, second word in this important verse, 
that we need to understand is the word race itself. As a Christian, as I mentioned earlier, you are called to run a race of faith. And the Greek word that the author uses here for race is the word agon, the word from which we get our word agony. And sometimes it's translated with our English word struggle. The Christian life, our author is telling us, is a struggle. And at times it's agonizing. Now the point that we're trying to make here is that the Greek word for race is not talking about a 100 yard dash. It's not even talking about a quarter mile race. But what it's talking about is a marathon, a race of several miles. A marathon, according to our dictionaries, is an endurance contest. That is, it's a race that is characterized by great strength and great perseverance. It's a race that is run on sheer grit. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, as Arthur says. That is, let us run with a faith that is tough, with a faith that won't shrink, with a faith that will not allow us to stay down. Let us run with a, a faith that causes us to get up again and to start running again. The third word or phrase that we need to understand the meaning of here in this first verse is the phrase, let us throw off everything that hinders. The one thing that I learned when I used to run the 440 was the importance of running light. Because my uncle was in the shoe business and had a shoe store, I was able to get a pair of track shoes that were made of kangaroo skin, the lightest leather known to man at this time. In our Christian life, the same principle also holds true. Unfortunately, as Christians, there are many things that Satan uses to weigh us down. And the most popular one is guilt. And this is why in the book of Revelation, he is called the accuser of our brothers, he who accuses them day and night. When does he accuse? Day and night. When you're awake in the middle of the night, when you get up in the morning, when you go through the day. Almost any time is accusation time for him, for his goal is to cause you to feel unworthy to go to God in prayer to cause you to feel unworthy to read God's word, to cause you to feel unworthy to serve in the church. Once anyone says to me, when I talk to them about, about ministry and they say they feel unworthy, it makes me wonder if they're not dealing with some kind of guilt that makes them feel that way. King David in Psalm 38 gives testimony to this weight of guilt when he writes, he says, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. David, however, being worn out by the burden of guilt, he finally goes to our Lord and he bears his sin with Bathsheba, the one that he had with Bathsheba. He confesses it to God. As he puts it in the 32nd Psalm, my strength was sapped as the heat in the summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, O Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, whose sin the Lord does not count against them. The Apostle John adds in the New Testament, he says, if we confess our sins to our Lord, he is faithful and he is just, and he will forgive us. That is, he will unburden us. He will take away that weight of guilt. Still others of us are weighed down by worry and anxiety. Because God doesn't want us to be weighed down by anxiety and worry, he says to us through the pen of the Apostle Paul, the Lord is near. So do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God in the peace of God which transcends all of human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And still others 
are weighed down by some kind of fear. And yet, with regards to any fear that we might have, John, in his epistle, he tells us that there is no fear in love, for perfect love, that is our Lord Jesus Christ, drives out all fear. The author of Hebrews says to us, unburden yourself of un any unnecessary weight. Get rid of it. Throw off everything that hinders. And the way to do this, of course, is by giving it to someone else, and that someone else is to God, to Jesus himself, as God's word tells us. Our Lord says, come unto me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Peter tells us in his epistle, cast all of your anxiety on Jesus because he cares for you. And the psalmist writes, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let you fall. Unload yourselves, the author of Hebrews is saying. Throw off everything that hinders. Bring them to Jesus. And then he adds, and the sin that so easily entangles. For years when I came across these words and the sin that so easily entangles, I, I, I would ask myself, what is that sin? It, it's in a singular, it's not a plural. It's talking about some specific sin. And I, I think I know what it is now. For I've seen Satan use it over and over again in the lives of believers. He uses it and uses it in order to keep them from getting up from finishing the race of faith when they have fallen. Is it not doubt? Is that not the sin that entangles? The dictionary defines doubt as a feeling of uncertainty about the truth. Isn't this the sin that entangles? A feeling of uncertainty about God's word? Isn't this the sin that so effectively entangled Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Did they not doubt God's word to them, thus bringing about their fall? And is not doubt the opposite of faith? Without faith, the author of Hebrews says to us, it is impossible to please God. Or as the Apostle Paul puts it, the only thing that counts with God is your expressing your life through faith. Now isn't this the one sin that Satan would like you to commit? To doubt God, to call into question his word, his will? To be uncertainty as to the validity of your prayers, of his promises? You see, every time you commit this sin, this means that like Adam and Eve, you have chosen to believe Satan rather than God. Is this not the one sin that so easily entangles, that so easily trips us up? Earlier in his epistle, this author of Hebrews writes, he says, anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and helps those who earnestly seek him. Must believe that he exists. So what God's word is saying to you and to me this morning is junk your excess weight, junk your guilt, junk your fears, Junk your anxieties. Junk those habits that are weigh, weighing you down or anything else that is hindering you from running the race of faith. And then our author adds in the next verse something that every runner knows, and that is to fix your eyes on the finish line. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author of Hebrews tells us. Fix your eyes on the author and the perfecter of your faith. In other words, focus your eyes on him as you run the race of faith. See him waiting at the finish line with a crown of glory in his hands for you as you finish this race of faith, your life. Let us pray. Father, once again, we just thank you for the encouragement that you give us in your holy word. And we know that as the Apostle Paul tells us, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the powers of darkness that would like to bring us down so that we are no longer effective in living our lives for you. And so when we fall, Father, when we get entangled, 
if you will, in that hurdle. We just pray, Father, that you give us the perseverance, the grit, to get up and to keep running as hard as we can towards the goal. And so we thank you for your word this morning, Father. We thank you for your love that is with us every step of the way. In Christ's name, amen.